Hi, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Hi, I'm so glad you're here with us today. My name is Jamie Seward, and I'm Associate Director of Lifelong Learning with the Office of Alumni Relations at Johns Hopkins University. Before we proceed, I'd like to acknowledge our co-sponsors, the Healthcare Affinity, the Women of Hopkins Affinity, and the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Before we proceed with our speaker, I'd like to encourage you to ask questions in the Zoom Q&A located at the bottom of your screen. The chat feature is open, but I ask that you not share your questions in the chat. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Shelley Bomick. Dr. Bomick is a double board certified physician specializing in preventative and lifestyle medicine. She earned her medical degree from the George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences and completed her master's in public health and preventative medicine residency at our very own Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She was a design thinking strategist at Cedar sinai Medical Center in LA and served as medical director of digital health for an executive health firm in New York City. She's the founder of Platform Wellness, a preventative and lifestyle medicine practice where she's dedicated to helping high achieving women experience sustainable success without having to sacrifice their health and well-being. And I don't know about you, but I'm really, really excited to listen to you today because I think um, a lot of us are experiencing burnout with all that's gone on in the world. So I will turn the program over to you and we're excited to have you here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Jamie. And let me go ahead and share my slides. And Jamie, if you could let me know in the chat, if you can see those slides, that would be great. Great, sounds good. All right. So thank you everyone uh, for having me today. Um, I want to talk about why mindset is medicine and why it's the best medicine for burnout in particular. As a doctor, I care a lot about the burnout my patients experience. The reason for that is because chronic stress has a big impact on your health. You probably already know that the leading causes of death in the US are chronic conditions like heart disease and cancer. But if you dig a bit deeper, you'll find that the actual causes of death are lifestyle related. They're the risk factors that lead to these chronic conditions like poor diet and exercise or tobacco and alcohol. Chronic stress influences these lifestyle factors. For example, you do your best to eat healthy, nutritious foods, but your plate ends up looking like this because you have a deadline to meet. Or, and I'll go back one, you, you know, are jazzed about trying a new at-home workout, but by the time you finish cleaning the living room, you're already exhausted. And you, know, you tell yourself that tonight is the night that you are going to bed on time, but your bed ends up looking like this because you're doom scrolling, because it seems like there's breaking news every minute of the day. This is why I'm here. I want you to be healthy and have a great quality of life, but that is nearly impossible to achieve if you're burned out. That's why in my practice, burnout is what I choose to treat. So let me formally introduce myself. My name is Dr. Shelley Bomick, did residency training here at Johns Hopkins in preventive medicine, and later got a second board certification in lifestyle medicine. I'm based in New York City and work in corporate wellness and executive health. And as part of that work, I provide preventive care and life design coaching to help people with burnout, especially women of color. Now, I just told you that I'm here because I want you to be healthy, which is true, but there's a little more to it than that. And it has to do with this photo here. So, I've had my own experiences with stress and burnout and mental health issues. I've dealt with them on and off throughout the years, ever since I lost my mom to cancer when I was in college. The beginning of 2020 though, just before COVID hit the US, things got pretty bad. 
And the worst part is that I didn't realize it. I didn't know how bad it was until one Friday evening rush hour when I was standing on the edge of the subway platform, wondering if I should push myself over the edge. That was a pivotal moment for me. I had never experienced anything like that before, and it scared me. I was one of those people who were so relieved to go into lockdown uh, at the start of the pandemic because I needed that time and space in order to heal. It was during that recovery that I experienced firsthand the transformational power of mindset. If you are suffering from burnout, I want you to experience this transformation for yourself. I started my practice, Platform Wellness, because as a physician, I feel that it's my duty to make sure that you do not end up at the edge of wherever you are standing. This is especially true for women, for people of color, and for anyone who feels marginalized. Now, I'm going to introduce you to this process, which I put together into a three-part framework that I call REST. REST stands for Revive, Strive, and Thrive. It's to help you overcome burnout, handle stress, and restore energy. And as you can see, I consider these steps to be building blocks. They are the foundation you need in place in order to design a healthy lifestyle. So these are the nine steps I coach patients and clients through, and they're the same steps I had to go through in order to heal. I'm going to cover each of these in more detail, and in the interest of time, I'll cover or highlight some more than others. One thing I'm not going to do, though, is spend much time on making the argument of why burnout is an issue, why it's a problem. I'm going to assume that we all agree that burnout is an issue. So type agree in the chat if that is okay with you, if that makes sense. Great, great, that's what I thought. All right, what I do want to spend a moment on though is defining what exactly burnout is. In 2019, the WHO recognized burnout as a syndrome that occurs in the occupational setting. It's a result of chronic workplace stress that's not well managed. And it has three main characteristics. Feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job, and reduced professional efficacy. So that's the definition of burnout. Now let's get started. The first phase is revive. And this phase is all about putting out the fire and addressing the burnout head on. Before you can do anything about burnout, you first have to recognize that that's what you're dealing with. It's not always obvious, but there are certain things you can look out for. And they relate back to the three bullet points I just mentioned. The most obvious one is the one that you probably ignore the most, and that's the physical signs and symptoms. You know, the fatigue, the brain fog, the muscle aches, the stomach aches, the hair loss, the weight loss, the weight gain, etc. Unless there's an underlying medical condition that's causing your burnout or your symptoms, there's a good chance that what you're experiencing is a result of chronic stress the inflammation that chronic stress creates in the body can result in all sorts of different symptoms. A lot of times I see patients chasing after these symptoms. They do a food sensitivity panel because they think there's something uh, in their diet that's causing their gut issues. Or they sign up for a monthly subscription to get hair loss medications sent to their home. They're desperate for answers and solutions, and understandably so. But let's be real here. If you're good about getting regular checkups with your doctor and your test results all come back negative, even though you're experiencing some symptoms, you need to ask yourself if 
your symptoms are because of chronic stress. Another thing I want to touch on in this step is imposter syndrome. Burnout is common among high, high achievers. And for those who are part of a marginalized group, they set the bar even higher for themselves because they feel pressure to prove their worth. This doesn't serve you in the long run though, because you're going to run out of steam. Remember that a characteristic of burnout is decreased performance. If you start to notice that you, you're falling short of that bar you set for yourself, that should be another indication to you that you're dealing with burnout. The next step here is to secure space. So once you acknowledge that you're dealing with burnout, it's time to create the space you need for healing. Taking time off is one, of, is one way to do this. It's usually the first thing that comes to mind for most people, but there are other ways to create space, literally and figuratively. For example, there's a lot of research on the health benefits of being in nature and in healing environments. So place yourself in surroundings that enhance your well-being. This could be as elaborate as working remotely from a fabulous Airbnb or as simple as clearing your workspace. Whatever it may be, give yourself that physical room to breathe. You also need to think about clearing things off your plate. Delegation is an important skill to hone, not only in your professional life, but also in your personal life. What responsibilities are you holding on to that you could potentially hand off to someone else? If you have a hard time with this, think about it in terms of energy. Keep the activities that sustain and fulfill you and delegate the ones that drain and deplete you. It's all about identifying the things in your life that recharge and replenish your energy. So the last step of this phase is to seek support. Don't go this alone. You need people by your side. Humans are social beings. We depend on one another for survival, especially in times of stress. And don't be afraid to be selective either about who you bring into your inner circle. If there's someone in your life that you find more draining than not, even if it's a close friend or family member, a coworker, it's okay if you need to create some distance from them. It's only temporary. Asking for help might feel scary, and that's why safe, feeling safe is so important. This is known as psychological safety. The idea of being able to take risks when you're in a group. We need to build safe environments for one another so we feel that permission to be vulnerable. This is especially true in virtual settings, where we need to be even more deliberate about checking in on one another to make sure we're okay. Finally, knowing when to get help, especially the help of health professionals, isn't always easy. If you remember from my story, even though I'm a doctor, I didn't realize I needed help until I was standing on that uh, subway platform. This is why leaning on others for support is so important. They can see things we can't because our view is clouded by all the smoke of burnout. Before we get into the second phase of the framework, let's do a quick uh, breathing exercise. So this traditional yoga exercise or technique is called the four, seven, eight breath. In, in this exercise, the tip of your tongue is going to be resting at the top of your mouth just behind your front teeth, so where those ridges are at the top of your mouth. And what you're going to do is inhale through your nose for four beats, hold for seven beats, and then exhale through your mouth for eight beats. So I'll show you one round of this, and then I'll lead you through a few, uh, a few rounds of this as well. So as you can see, I'm sitting, my back is straight, my feet are grounded, and I'm going to uh, exhale before I start.
Okay, so that was one round. So go ahead and get into a comfortable position, let out an exhale, and let's uh, start. In, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Last one. In, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, you can go ahead and open your eyes. Breathing techniques are powerful because they turn on your parasympathetic nervous system, which kind of acts like a brake, a brake pedal in your body. It slows everything down and triggers a relaxation response so that your body can come back to its balanced state, which is called homeostasis. And the best part is that these techniques are readily available. You can do them anytime, anywhere. You want to bring your attention to your body and you'll see why that's important in this next phase. So the first step of this phase is to restore routine. I usually get a lot of questions for this step, so I'm going to spend more time on this one. In the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, there are six main pillars to healthy living. Three of those pillars are nutrition, physical activity, and sleep. Those are the three that I believe are the most important to focus on when you are recovering from burnout. Now, I want to be uh, clear about this. I'm not saying to go sign up for a half marathon or start intermittent fasting. You know, for some people, that may be their starting point, but for other people, it's not. What I care about here is your baseline. When I say to restore routine, I am talking about getting back to the very basics of self-care and sustenance. What are the things you need to do in order to nourish your body? So let me go through some examples here. This first quote is really popular among lifestyle medicine doctors. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Eat food refers to eating fresh whole foods or foods that are minimally processed. One way to incorporate more of these foods into your diet is by doing what's called shopping the perimeter. So if you think of a supermarket, the perimeter is where you'll find all the foods that spoil or go bad. You want to eat more of these foods and less of the foods that are packaged and on the shelves in the middle of the supermarket. Next is not too much, and that refers to portion control. Uh, a while back, Google did a social experiment with its employees to help them make healthier choices. One test was to use smaller plates in the dining areas, and this is easy to try at, at home. Instead of uh, using or having your meals on the larger 11 or 12 inch size dinner plates, try using the smaller eight to 10 inch uh, lunch plates or, or salad plates. Another way to think about portion control, it has to do with how you divide your plate. So if half of your plate is non-starchy vegetables, a quarter is lean proteins, and the other quarter is fiber-rich carbohydrates, that's pretty well balanced. That's a good place to be. And then there's mostly plants. And again, let me be clear here. Am I asking you to be vegan? No. Am I asking you to swap out your bag of chips for some celery and hummus? Yes. You know, make those small changes that you know are going to be good for your body. That brings me to the next uh, point, which is physical activity. The CDC has guidelines and recommendations for physical activity, but 
I don't even want to get that complicated here. I just want you to move your body in whatever way feels good to you. So if that means doing light stretches, great. If that means going on weekend hikes, great. When it comes to exercise in this step in particular, think less about demanding your body to perform certain physical activities and think more about doing what feels good to your body. If you do want some way to assess how your exercise is going, I recommend the talk test, which is this. If you can talk but not sing while you exercise, that means you're doing moderate activity. And that's a pretty good level to be at. And finally, please get rest. This may be easier said than done, but the goal is to get seven to nine hours of sleep and to not dip below six hours. Getting a good night's sleep requires you to be diligent and purposeful about going to bed on time. It'll help if you avoid eating or drinking three hours before bed, and if you avoid screens or screen time one and a half hours before bed. And remember here, your body has a diurnal rhythm, not a weekly rhythm. It doesn't know the difference between a weeknight and weekend because you're, to your body, it's all the same. So unfortunately, the, that means trying to play catch up on the weekends isn't going to work here. All right, let's transition to the next step, which is to tackle triggers. A big part of being able to handle stress and prevent burnout is to understand what stresses you out in the first place. As humans, we are programmed to focus on all the threats in our environment. We evolved as a species because of this negativity bias. And this is again, another instance where tuning into your body is going to be crucial. Before I continue, I want you to answer in the chat a few questions. Uh, these questions are oversimplified, but I do think they're helpful in terms of setting up this, uh, this discussion. So the first question is, are emotions and feelings the same? So yes, and, yes or no. Are emotions and feelings the same? Okay. All right, I see a lot of no's. Great. And question marks, okay, okay. Let me ask you the second question. Are emotions mental or physical? So type in either mental or physical. Are emotions mental or physical? So mental, both, okay, okay, great. And then last question. Are feelings mental or physical? So again, type in the chat. Mental or physical? I'm getting a lot of boats. Mentals, physicals. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Let me uh, let me first go through what emotions are. Uh, a basic definition of emotions is that they're the physical reactions that occur in your body in response to your environment. The most common example of this is the fight or flight response. For example, you're crossing the street and all of a sudden you see a car that's about to hit you. So what happens? Your heart races, your breath quickens, and you jump out of the way. Those changes in your body, those are emotions. And what you want to do is try to notice when you experience those changes or those emotions throughout your day. They're obviously not going to be as intense as they are in that example, but they are there. You literally have a body of data and it's your job to collect that data because it's your emotions that can tell you what your triggers are. Something worth pointing out here is that emotions aren't positive and negative or good and bad. Emotions are neutral. Now. Some may be more pleasant than others, I'll give you that. For example, if you had to choose between the emotions that you feel when you're dodging a car versus when you're having sex, 
you probably would choose the latter. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, type yes in the chat. Okay. Okay, yes, does make sense. All right. All right, see, I'm, I'm a doctor, so I get to talk about sex in webinars. So the, the bottom line here, let yourself experience all of your emotions that come up. Sometimes I think we're afraid to do that because we get overwhelmed by all of our emotions. But there's a beach ball analogy for this that I find helpful. If you think of your emotions as a beach ball, what most people do is that they try to hide it. They push that ball down and try to keep it underwater. That requires a lot of energy from you. And I think it's worth you know, a reminder here that you're already running low on energy because you're burned out. So what ends up happening? Eventually that ball bounces back up to the surface. Sometimes it even splashes you because it bounces back with such force. What you want is for just letting that ball be. Let it float on the surface of the water. You're acknowledging that it's there, but because you're not trying to hide it, you're not having to spend the energy controlling it either. All right. As you can tell from the title of this talk, I consider this to be the most impactful step of the framework. I just explained what emotions are. Now, let me explain what feelings are. Feelings are the mental processes that happen in response to the thoughts you have. Again, feelings are the mental processes that happen in response to the thoughts you have. Let's go back to the example of crossing the street. You see the car coming. Your brain registers the car as a threat. It floods your body with emotion so you can instinctively jump out of the way. Your mind then processes what has just happened. You might have a thought like, oh my God, that, that car almost hit me. That thought then scares you. And because you feel scared, you're extra cautious when you cross the next street. In psychology, this is called the cognitive triad. Your actions are a result of your feelings and your feelings are a result of your thoughts. In other words, your thoughts control everything. And this is important because when these thoughts are dysfunctional beliefs, that's when you run into trouble. I'll go back to my story about the subway platform to explain this. Personally, colorism played a role in leading me to that platform edge. I'm South Asian, I have dark skin, and in my culture, as in other cultures, if you have dark skin, you're looked down upon. I absorbed this message at a very young age and I interpreted the message to mean that I would never be enough. What I didn't realize was that this limiting belief then permeated into the rest of my life. I became obsessed with perfectionism. I had to compensate for the color of my skin because I held onto this truth that I would never be enough. I pushed myself so hard that it fueled the burnout and eventually pushed me to that platform edge. The game changer though, was when I realized that I could question the beliefs. You know, what if I'm enough? What if I've always been enough? What if I'm more than enough? You see, you have the agency to rewrite the stories that you tell yourself. You must identify and reframe these limiting beliefs. If you're familiar with the work of Byron Katie, you'll know that a simple but powerful way to begin this process is just by asking yourself, is it true? Is this belief that I hold on to, can I absolutely 100% know that it's true? When the answer is no, there's your in. There's your chance to turn things around. Once you change the narrative, once you change those base 
basic thoughts, then your feelings begin to change. And once your feelings begin to change, then your actions change. You're able to respond to situations instead of react to them. The research on neuroplasticity supports this too. It shows us that at a cellular level, it's possible to rewire these circuits uh, in your brain. So while you may not have uh, you know, control over all the stressors that are in your life, you can control how you respond to them. You control your actions because you control your thoughts. And that's why mindset is the best medicine for burnout. Okay, so I know that was a lot. Before we get into this last phase, let's do another quick breathing exercise. So this yoga technique is called the box breath. And you may know this as sniper breathing because it's used by Navy SEALs. Uh, like the first exercise, you're going to start by exhaling through your mouth. Uh, for the rest of the exercise, you'll breathe through your nose. You're going to hold for four beats, inhale four beats, hold four beats, exhale four beats. Again, I'll show you one round of this and then I'll count you through a few rounds as well. Okay. Okay. All right, so go ahead, get into another comfortable position and we'll go ahead and start. So hold two, three, four, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. Last one. Hold, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. Okay, you can go ahead and open your eyes. Now let's get to the good stuff. Thrive is all about optimizing your lifestyle so that you can enjoy a great quality of life. First of all, simplify your lifestyle. Don't make it harder than it has to be. Here are some ideas on how you can do that. One is to save decision-making for the big stuff. Decision fatigue and choice overload are very real. If you plan to invest energy working on your mindset, you can't spend it on trivial things. So figure out what works for you. Maybe you're the kind of person who likes to meal prep and plan for the week. Or maybe the idea of having a capsule wardrobe appeals to you. There's a reason why successful people like Obama and Jobs and Zuckerberg, why they wear the same outfit every day. Speaking of Jobs and Zuckerberg, another suggestion is to think about how you use technology. Technology is designed to change the way you behave by taking advantage of the reward circuitry in your brain. You learn to crave those dopamine hits as soon as you start your day. For example, again, tell me in the chat, how many of you check your work email as soon as you wake up? Yes or, yes or no, or actually, you know what? Type me in the chat if that's you. Type me if you check your work email as soon as you get up. Yeah, there are a lot, a lot of me's, yes. Hope you see that you're not alone on this. So, you know, what can you do, right? Well, you know, you could get an alarm clock and keep that phone in a separate room. But if you do need to use your phone, there are some, you know, there are some things that you can do. You could change the settings. Uh, for example, you know, put on the do not disturb setting, the do not disturb mode, or switch the display to grayscale. That's one of my favorites to do. Make that phone less enticing. The most underutilized feature on all of our phones iPhone or Android is the power button. I mean, when was the last time you turned your phone off? 
if you can't think of the answer right away, then that should tell you something. It's been too long, right? Take advantage of technology. Don't let technology take advantage of you, okay? Finally, work with the natural rhythms of your body. Whether it's the sleep cycle or menstrual cycle, hormonal changes affect how you feel. Listen to your body and support yourself as you go through these changes. A good example of this is perimenopause. I've seen many high-powered female executives in clinic thinking that there's something wrong with them. You know, they, they worked their butts off to get to where they are. And now all of a sudden they're not performing like they used to. They feel tired, they can't focus, they're gaining weight even though they haven't changed anything that they're doing. These aren't signs of something being wrong with your body, they're just signs of your body going through a natural process. The best thing you can do is ease your efforts by finding ways to work with these changes instead of working against them. All right. And tell me, okay, great. We're on the habit side now. Yes, habits are the foundation for a healthy lifestyle. So people always want to know what it takes to build good habits. That's why books like Atomic Habits and, and uh, Tiny Habits are so popular. You know, so what does it take? Well, for starters, you have to believe that you can do it. This is called self-efficacy. It's like that quote attributed to Henry Ford. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. You don't necessarily need to know how you're going to do, how you're going to reach your goal, but you do need to have the conviction that you can get there. Now, I know the how is what trips most people up, but this is where your motivation or your why comes into play. There are two types of motivation, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic is when you do something for an external outcome, like to get a reward or to avoid a punishment. Intrinsic is when you do something for your own personal satisfaction. You're less likely to do things when you're extrinsically motivated because you feel pressured or forced to do it. But with intrinsic motivation, you're much more likely to do things because it resonates with who you are. Figure out what your why is, and then figure out if you're ready to make the change. In motivational interviewing, uh, a simple tool that we use is called the readiness ruler. And that's to gauge whether or not client will be successful in making, uh, in making health changes. And you can use this tool too. You just ask yourself on a scale of one to 10 with one being not at all and 10 being absolutely, how ready am I to make this change? If you can give yourself a seven or higher, that's when you know you're ready to move forward. I wanna wrap this step up by talking about mindset again. When it comes to the science of habit formation, there's a particular type of mindset that's been shown to be effective and that's a learning my mindset. There's research uh, being done that shows that people who are successful in losing and maintaining weight loss, they're, they're successful because they don't view their setbacks as failures. They consider setbacks to be opportunities to exper experiment or iterate and really figure out what works or what doesn't work for their lifestyle. They keep adjusting their approach until they reach their goal. These small steps make big differences. I mean, how empowering is it to know that you can never fail? You know, that as long as you remain flexible, you're always moving forward and closer to your goal. All right. So the last step is to work on your relationships. The conditions in which you live, learn, work, and play are called the social determinants of health, and community is one of the main uh, determinants. Your relationships with your family, friends, 
neighbors, coworkers, they all have a major impact on your health and well being. There's a Harvard study that's still going on. It's one of the longest running studies ever. And uh, what they found in this study is that it's not necessarily your physical health that predicts how, how you're going to grow old, how you're going to age. It's how satisfied you are in your relationships. Good quality relationships are what make you happier, healthier, and live longer. I'd like you to keep in mind though that the longest relationship you're ever going to be in is the one with yourself. The science of self-compassion shows us how important it is to practice kindness and mindfulness and common humanity. So care for yourself as you already care for others. So there you have it. Those are the nine steps of the REST method. Again, those steps are to detect distress, secure space, seek support, restore routine, tackle triggers, master mindset, ease efforts, hone habits, and cultivate connections. And to recap, here are the nine main takeaways as well. Listen to what your body is telling you. Give yourself the grace to slow down. Surround yourself with good people. Get back to the basics. Experience your emotions. Choose to respond, not react. Do away with what doesn't serve you. Make big change little by little. And again, care for yourself as you do others. The most important question I ask every patient and client is this one. How are you? How are you feeling? It's important because it tells me so much about their health and well-being. So I want to know from you uh, in the audience, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Type one word in the chat to, to let me know how you're feeling right now. All right. Okay, so we gotta have a mix, have a mix of feelings here. Okay. Okay. I uh I want to leave you with a quote that had a big impact for me. And this quote is attributed to Viktor Frankl, who was a Holocaust survivor. And it goes like this. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. If you are dealing with burnout, know that you absolutely have the power to overcome it. It's a choice for you to make, and you can make that choice if you believe that mindset is medicine. So if you want to take a deeper dive into the REST method, I've created a workbook for you that you can download by going to this address, shellybomick.com slash thank you. Uh, it summarizes the main points of this presentation, and it also includes journal prompts so you can do reflections on your own or in a group. For those of you who live in the New York City area and are interested in burnout screenings, that information is on the website. And for those of you who aren't in the area but are interested in coaching, that information is also on the website too. So again, I want to thank you so much for your time. And Jamie, I will uh, turn it back to you. I'll stop my screen share here. It's okay. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. And I see from our strong attendance and all the engagement we had in the chat that I, I think it's safe to say that everybody really enjoyed this. Um, I do have one question in the chat um, for you, or in the, uh, sorry, Q&A. What is the difference between allowing your emotions to surface and pers perseverating? Ah, interesting. Okay. Allowing the emotions to surface, that refers to literally experiencing them, feeling them. Um, you know, instead of kind of brushing them to the side, acknowledging that, you know, okay, I, I'm nervous. Let me, let me take some deep breaths because for whatever reason I'm nervous, um, being able to kind of pause in that moment is going to help you with experiencing them uh, 
experiencing them fully. And when we do that, that's when the emotions are much less overwhelming. You know, if we can just let them, uh, let them flow through us, then we can kind of continue on with our day. Um, the perseverating, I feel like that, I feel like that refers more towards maybe the feelings, you know, the going back to the cognitive triad, thoughts leading to feelings, leading to actions. Based on these uh, dysfunctional or limiting beliefs we have, these thoughts, they make us feel a certain way. And I think perhaps that's where, um, that's where that perseverating comes from, you know, just being in that space. And then because we're in that space, we, we do or don't take actions that we, that we want. So, yeah. Wonderful. Well, this was so educational and so lovely, and you're so lovely. Um, I did see in the chat, someone said, you're beautiful, and you certainly are inside and out. Um, so thank you so much. Um, to everybody, you will receive a copy of the recording and a follow-up email that will contain lots of information, including how to get in touch with Dr. Bomek and how to reach out to her and use her services. Um, she's, she's wonderful, so I strongly encourage you to... Uh, take advantage of um, her. And uh, I'll send you an email with those resources and um, our event schedule. Hopefully you'll join us at a future program. So with that, I wish you mental health, good mental health, peace, uh, good physical health, stay away from COVID if you can. And uh, I hope everyone has a glorious weekend. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you.